good afternoon to all of you. Uh, Professor K.S. James, Dr. Poonam Mutreja, distinguished invitees, retired faculty and alumni, faculty, staff, and students of IIPS, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of International Institute for Population Sciences, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to this 11th Professor Asha Bende Memorial Lecture today. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Poonam Mudreja, Executive Director of the Population Foundation of India, New Delhi, as our speaker on this occasion. She is the most visible and articulate voice of gender justice and reproductive rights in India today. Dr. Mutreja will be speaking to us on a very relevant and a crucial issue of concern to all of us, that is the roadmap to population stabilization, a case of reaching the unreached. This annual lecture series is being organized in memory of one of the eminent demographer and reproductive rights expert, Professor Asha Atmaram Bende, who was teacher to many of us. She was an accomplished academician and a prolific writer. Educated at Bombay University, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, and University of California, Berkeley, in sociology and public health, Dr. Bende was a professor of IAPS for many years. Her book, titled as Principles of Population Studies, co-authored with the Professor Tara Kanitkar of IAPS, has had more than 22 editions over the years, indicating its popularity among the population scientists and the students of demography. She was a very popular teacher and mentored and nurtured large number of demographers and reproductive health experts both in India and abroad. She served as an advisor to several organizations such as University Grant Commission, NACO, Family Planning Training and Research Center, and she was a visiting fellow at the Population Institute, Australian National University, Canberra, and also at the East West Center, Hawaii, USA. Professor Bende worked as a consultant to many international and national organizations, including ILO, UNFPA, Rockefeller Foundation, World Vision, National Association for the Blind, and Organization for Educational Resources and Technical Training. She was a board member of the Foundation for Research in Health Systems and National Association for the Blind and was also the chairperson of the Ashish Gram Rajana Trust at the Indian Institute of Health Management, Pachod in Maharashtra. Her book on her life, titled as Majya Jagatmi, In My Own World Am I, was published. Professor Bende was also a highly accomplished actress with a training in music and dance. Professor Bende passed away in 2010. Professor Asha Bende was a unique combination of artistic talent and academic brilliance, who is remembered with respect and affection by her students, colleagues, and friends. We welcome you all to this 11th Professor Asha Bende Memorial Lecture. Now I request Professor James, Director of IAPS, to chair this session, introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Mutreja, and also moderate the discussion. Thank you all. Over to Professor James. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shekhar, Professor Mutreja, and the distinguished invitees and participants, ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed a great pleasure for me as well to welcome Pune Mutreja to deliver the Asha Bende Memorial Lecture for this year. I think the Pune's work very closely linked to Professor Asha Bende's activities after her retirement, perhaps, because after soon after her 
illustrious career at IIPS as a very distinguished academic, she has taken up a course really to serve the underserved. So she has started an NGO with the name the within the health management Indian Institute of Health Management Pachod, which is called Ashish Gram Tachina Trust. And she has not merely giving service is only one thing, but you know, at the same time, integrating research with the the service, I think both of them together, she was leading a life which is has been relevant to the both to the policy with the program as well as to large number of people she has been serving to this trust. I don't know whether I need to really make efforts to introduce Poonam because it's really tough for me to <laughs> introduce Ms. Poonam because she has been active in the areas of the women's empowerment, issues related to women, the issues related to family planning, issues related to the reproductive health for such a long time in India and most articulated voice among us, especially in the policy circles and also in the research as well as in the academic circles. Because I her this stint at the MacArthur Foundation has been, I think, remembered. I don't think that many people really will forget because that has been most articulate time perhaps for the women's in India, I, I would even imagine. How actually women's issues come to the forefront in the Indian debates and discussion. It was not that much, I don't think that even at the 80s, other than the MacArthur Foundation, where Punam was really leading the taking up the issues of the women in this country, 80s and 90s. I think this is this, is, this has been remarkable. I think not only for the MacArthur, before that she has been at working in the various places. I don't want to list all of them, but she also has educated in the Delhi University, then Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government. And when I'm also was serving in various very prestigious committees, both of the government as well as for leading international and national organizations, so that she had to make that voice felt for the people who are underserved or unreached or perhaps needs the support and help. I think today's topic, Ms. Winam, I think it is really apt in that respect because you are really giving a topic on the case of reaching the unreached because we always valorize on what is the progress we have made, especially on the population front in recent times. And the NFH is showing that we have reached replacement level. This is sort of celebrated by the media as well as various discussions soon after the release of the NFHS a couple of weeks back. But we really need to also look at where are we lagging? What are the areas where we have serious problems? What are the, the groups and the, the emphasis where we need to make in particular sections of the population where we need to intervene? So this is really very, very important especially in the context when we really look at very aggregate data and then take a very conclusions which perhaps may omit many sections of the population which are underserved which has not yet reached which are really far away from achieving either population stabilization or even that matter many of the health program indicators so actually i think it is you are the right person in india to speak about that we are really happy that you have accepted our invitation and be with us today. I think with all the, I know there are difficulties with your time as well as all other issues. We, are, we thank you for this. Fortunately, let me also inform all of you that Ms. Poonam is also serving our Board of Governors, which is called the, the Executive Council. She is also a member of our Executive Council and helping the Institute on various matters because, you know, Executive Council has really a big task ahead in taking forward the vision of the Institute and also making it be practical in implementation. So Funam has been really at the forefront in supporting all our activities. Thank you so much once again. Over to you, Poonam, to take forward this lecture.
Thank you so much and thank you to both of you for the very kind words. I feel very honored um, hearing about myself from you. I feel really honored, but I feel even more honored and privileged to be delivering the lecture in memory of late Professor Asha Bende uh, and on the subject so close to her heart. You know, I the formal uh, introduction, I did my research on Dr. Bende and I was very inspired reading about her. But what I did not know till this morning is that Dr. Bende is somebody I've heard so much about from her daughter, Dr. Purnima Mane, who many of you must be knowing. Dr. Mane was the executive director of Population Fund, uh, Popula uh, UNFPA in New York and retired as president of uh, Pathfinder Fund, global president. And you know, P uh, Purnima Mane, who I've known for more, almost four decades, half a conversation when we talked about women was about her mother. What a great person with two passions. Women was one passion. Uh, women and family planning was one passion and bringing up and the balance of family life was another passion. She brought up her daughters, her daughter and son equally. And I'm sure many of you know her name was Lily Moses Isaacile before. She was a, she is Jewish and the way she brought up her children, her father was Maharashtrian and the way the children were brought up, they knew nothing about class and differences a true, true, apart from a great scholar um, and actor, uh, theater was her passion. She was a very secular person who brought up very strong children who, as once Purnima said, they made me misfit when I discovered in college caste and other things. And I have to say that um, while I was honored after I knew who Dr. Bende was, but listening to, uh, remembering that she was the same powerful mother of Purnima Mane gave me an added passion to, and a uh, good feeling to speak about her today. And just a couple of things that I'd like to add about her is she was a gold medalist from, excelled in everything. She was a gold medalist from Tata Institute. She taught both first and second year, and she went on to do her PhD finally, and had three masters. Uh, she had, along with three children, so I had, uh, two children, so I'd like to say five strong degrees. Um, um, uh, also, I would like to say that it is uh, the work she did um, in the development sector has greatly inspired me, and I kept hearing about her, Pachod, I was associated with, and I kept hearing wherever I go, I hear about her. So wherever you are, Dr. Pende, we are thinking of you and inspired by you. So I've chosen to talk on the roadmap for population stabilization for two, actually three reasons. One is that roughly 1.37 uh, billion people in India, which is the numbers are numbing. Um, uh, 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 India being the second most populous country in the world, according to the latest UN World Development Population Prospect Report 2027, India is expected to take the first spot uh, from China. And your own, uh, very um, own Professor Kulkarni, former director, uh, in his recent paper in uh, on the demographics and regional decomposition, um, of prospective population growth for India between 2021 and 2101 estimates that India's population size will peak at close to 1.68 billion, uh, a billion around 2061, after which India's population will begin to decline gradually. Um, I, um, uh, uh, I believe that we need every stage India should have and India should continue to have a roadmap and India's roadmap is greatly facilitated by NFHS, um, which is something is one of the greatest contribution 
IIPS does, and all of you are involved and engaged in that. And I was saying earlier that if I'm able to speak and articulate population issues and often challenge the myths and misconceptions around population issues um, and often um, prove what our senior policymakers or pol political leaders are saying is not correct, it's because I rely on and my lamppost and my crutch is IIPS's NFHS. So um, uh, um, I, 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 I am very grateful to be associated with uh, IPS. So a study from the Institute of Public Health uh, for Health, the Institute for Health Matrix and Evaluation, IHME, in the University of Washington, um, Seattle published uh, a study in the Lancet, which predicted that India's population may peak even earlier at 1.6 by 2048. This study predicted a steep decline in the total fertility. I think my slide one should be out. Uh, thank you. In total fertility rate, uh, which will drop to 1.3 along with the total population among down to 1.1 billion by the year 21,000. Such, projection, uh, 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 such projections about numbers should not be a cause for concern, I believe. The population problem, and I want to repeat the problem as many refer to it as is not about numbers. It is about people, and even more importantly, it is about the agency or lack of it for of Indian women. Uh, and that's why the focus a fair amount on women today and women's empowerment. In this lecture, I want to argue that while there is much to celebrate on the numbers front, there is still a large unfinished agenda linked to population stabilization. Um, and this has to do with addressing the re reproductive rights of the unreached, especially those women who continue to have more children than they want to, and more broadly, a large majority of women extending beyond the poor who do not have the right over their bodies to be able to exercise control over marriage as well as fertility decisions. So let me start with the good news on the numbers front. This recently released NFHS5 data confirms, or should I say reconfirms again, that India is well on the course towards population stabilization. As you can see in the slide, there has been a marked decline in India's annual rate of population growth from 24.7% during 1971-81 to 21.5%. In 1991, 2001, and further to 17.7% .7 in 2021-2011. India's population growth rate is expected to decline uh, to its lowest since the independence in 2011-21 decade, with the decadal growth rate of 12.5%. And it is expected to decline further to 8.4% in the decade 2021-2031 decade. India's um, birth rate, which was 40 per 100,000, no, 40 per 1,000 population in 1951, is down to 20, half. The NFHS surveys have also been debunking the myth of population explosion. NFHS 5 reaffirms what we always knew and was bound to happen India's total fertility rates have been steadily declining, falling across India in rural areas as well as urban areas. Five years ago in 2015-16, uh, even though TFR had fallen to 
two very close to the replacement rate and the urban TFR was down to 1.8, below the replacement of 2.1. This was not the case for TFR in rural areas where it was 2.4, above the replacement rate of 2.1. So five years later, the situation is different today. India's TFR is 2.1 or lower um, uh, in both rural as well as urban areas. Quite, uh, next slide, yeah, thank you. Quite apart from India reaching the replacement level fertility of 2.1, it is quite an achievement that only five out of 28 states and eight union territories have a TFR that exceeds the replacement level of 2.1, which is Bihar, Meghalaya, Manipur, Uttar Pradesh, and Mizoram. In a lighter vein, I'm uh, glad that the term Bimaru states, coined by renowned, the renowned demographer, uh, 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 Professor Ashish Bose, has dropped out of the population uh, development lexicon. Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, and Uttar Pradesh. I'm sure if Professor, Professor Ashish Bose were alive today, he could have resisted, he could not have resisted from perhaps coining the more contemporary and appropriate acronym for Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, Manipur, Meghalaya, and Mizoram, which I would say B-U-M-M-M, BUM. I mentioned earlier that population is not about numbers. It is indeed about people, as it should be. Uh, population explosion is a myth, but I also want to debunk the myth that population growth uh, is about religions. The declining trend uh, in population growth and fertility is, a secular, is secular and can be seen among all religious groups. L let's not skirt the issue and look at the Hindu-Muslim question. Contrary to what could be a manipulated public opinion, it is true that the Muslims have been growing faster than Hindus. The population growth rate for Muslims showed the higher, but, but the population growth rate for Muslims showed the highest decline of 4.7 percentage points between 2001 and 2011 as compared to the previous decades. The decline in Hindu population growth rate over the same period was 3.1 percentage points. Uh, the table shows the TFRs for two uh, low fertility states, which is Kerala, and Tamil Nadu, and two high fertility states, which is Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. Two points are important to note here. One, Muslim women in the southern states have lower fertility than Hindu women in the northern states. I'm referring to the two northern states here. The total fertility amongst Hindus of Uttar Pradesh which is 2.67, is higher than that of Hindus of Kerala. The fertility rate of Muslims in UP, 3.10, is higher than the fertility rate of Muslims in Kerala, which is 1.86. The fertility rate amongst Muslim women in Kerala, which is 1.86, and Tamil Nadu, 1.74, is lower than the fertility rate among Hindu women in Bihar uh, and Uttar Pradesh. What this establishes, however, is that there is no Hindu fertility, Muslim fertility, or for that matter, Christian fertility. So two across all states, the total fertility rates among Muslim women is higher than among the Hindu women, even in Kerala and Tamil Nadu. This is worrying, and I shall address this concern later. An important factor that has helped reduce fertility uh, rates is due to child survival. Reduced child, 
reduced child deaths are essential to lower fertility rates as well as population growth. Child survival improves, and then after a generation or so, fertility declines. This is what you see the graph. Um, uh, you see in the graph TFR and IMR declining in parallel, but as one would expect, declines in total fertility rate follow from declines in infant mortality rate. So um, most significant in the decision um, So most significant in the decision making by families is the replacement factor, the death of a child or so, or the probability of a child dying would prompt many couples to replace the loss by having many more children than they wanted. It will be difficult for us in this audience to recount even a single case of an infant death unless due to an extraordinary medical condition. Empirically, therefore, child survival improves and then after a generation or so, total TFR declines. And that is what is displayed in the graph. Improvements in child survival give confidence to young couples to decide the number of children they want to have. If a young couple today decides they want to have only one child, a majority of them will, would have taken such a decision with full confidence. The probability of the child dying is extremely low. For most families, and surviving is extremely very, surviving is extremely very high indeed. So let me move to the core of the lecture, that is making a case for the unreached. The population battle has not been won yet. We cannot be complacent. Averages hide huge disparities and inequalities. And that goes for the TFR as well as replacement levels. Uh, as well as while there is reason to celebrate the fact that India's TFR has come down to below the replacement levels, the disparities are indeed worrying and we need to do something. Here again, we should look at geographies, but focus on people and in particular women. We Next slide, please. We know that fertility rates depend on, upon the level of the mother's education. Um, in 2010, 2015-16, uh, mothers with no schooling reported a TFR of over three. On the other hand, mothers with 10 or more years of education or schooling reported a TFR of less than two. The real challenge lies in identifying uh, contexts where girls are able to complete 10 or more years of schooling and do something about it. There are a major segment of the unreached population whom we need to get to immediately. Um, there is no time to lose. Uh, NFHS 5 tells us that 2019-21, only 41% 41, 41 of women 15 to 49 years of age had completed 10 or more years of schooling. Uh, in rural India, it was just a little over one third in Kerala, more than three out of four women between the age 15 to 49 years, which is 77 percent, uh, had completed 10 years or more of schooling. 75 percent of rural areas and 78 percent of urban areas. Let's contrast this with the situation in Bihar where less than 30% of the women, um, which is 20, almost 29% to be precise, had completed 10 or more years of schooling. 
Sadly, only 25% of women between 15 and 49 years in rural Bihar had completed 10 or more years of schooling in Bihar. However, there is, is another matter of concern as well. If we notice that the fertility rate amongst Muslim women is higher than amongst Hindu women across most states, there is a reason for this. Uh, according to the Sachar Committee report, uh, Muslims have low, uh, have low level access to educational opportunities and their educational attainment is as bad as or even worse than the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes and other backward classes in India. A decade and a half later, the situation has not changed. For, in, for Muslims, according to a recent NSSO um, report, the percentage of youth who are currently enrolled in educational institutions is the lowest amongst Muslims. Only 39% of Muslims in the age group 15 to 24 years um, are enrolled as against 44% of scheduled castes, 51% of Hindu OBCs, and 59% of Hindu upper caste. Um, slide seven. The next slide, please. Fertility rates also depend on caste and economic um, status. NFHS also reveals that TFR amongst women uh, in the lowest wealth quintile is above three, whereas the TFR is lower than two in the higher wealth quintiles. Access to family planning, for instance, depends on which quintile you are and where you live. Similarly, the TFR amongst scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, and other backward castes is above the replacement rate of 2.1 still. This is where we have to understand the, inter, the intersectionalities between caste, class, gender. Women who are least educated are likely to belong to the lowest wealth quintiles and to socially backward communities. This is why I say that population challenge still remains unresolved, especially for the most marginalized. How do we lower fertility then rates amongst these categories of women? Clearly, basic education plays an important role in reducing fertility. I always call it the magic pill. Um, I'm told that when the Chief Minister of Bihar, Sri Nitish Kumar, was shown the graph he immediately figured out what needs to be done uh, to reduce the fertility rates in Bihar. His family planning program focused on giving a big push to girls' education and ensuring that girls completed at least 10 years of schooling. I'm told this is what motivate is the motivation behind giving bicycles to girls for them to attend school, especially when it was not within walking distance um, uh, schools, as we know one reason because of the distance girls drop out of school. It is equally important to ensure that the benefits of economic growth flow equitably to all sections of society. The World Inequality Report 2022 brought out by the World Inequality Lab points out that India is amongst the most unequal countries in the world. The top 10% hold 57% of the total national income and the bottom 50% hold only 13% of the total national income. According to the report, India stands out as a poor and very unequal country with an affluent elite. Clearly, India can be proud of its growth performance, but that is it. 
Is it just that we need better policies to ensure equitable growth, to ensure that the benefits flow to a vast majority of people and not get concentrated in the hands of the few? Let me move to the next segment of my lecture. I'd mentioned in the beginning that in addition to reaching the unreached, it is important to reach out to a large majority of women extending beyond the poor. Mar uh, we do not have the right over their women who do not have the right over their bodies to be able to exercise control over marriage and fertility decisions. We know that young girls are very, have very little say over marriage um, decisions. The Uday study survey con, um, by the Population Council on understanding the lives of adolescents and young adults uh, points out that 20, in 2016, in Bihar, 16, 61% of the girls married um, um, uh, girls, uh, 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 sorry, and young adults can, uh, married, 61% of married girls in the age group 15 to 99 years had been excluded from exercising the choice to choose their husbands. And 77% of them were meeting their spouses for the first time on their wedding night. The lack of freedom spills over to as far as fertility is concerned. In the ultimate analysis, high fertility rate reflects the limited control women have over their fertility. Um, we know that women across India want to have fewer children. Uh, the table, this table shows that wanted fertility rate and the actual fertility um, uh, fertility rate, there's a difference. In 2015-16, women in both rural and urban India want to have fewer children but end up having more than two children. Even women with less then five years of school, schooling want to have fewer children, um, fewer than two, but end up having more than two. Um, it is also important to note that Muslim women also want to have no more than two children, just like the Hindu women. Why is this so? It is because women do not have enough of a say over their fertility decisions. Uh, unfortunately, even after noting that women are not e able to decide how many children they want to have, we find that the onus of family planning, as we know also from NFHS 5, the onus for family planning is entirely on women. Next slide, please. Slide 9. NFHS 4 informed us that close to 98% of women know about a modern contraceptive. However, only 57% of currently married women use a modern method of contraceptive. The increase over 15 years in the use of modern contraceptive methods has been very marginal, from 49% in 2005-06 to 57% in 2019-21. So why is this so? Uh, once again, this only goes to show how little say Indian women have in family planning decisions. Next, please. Sadly, female sterilization is most commonly accessed modern method of family planning. This is in sharp contrast to male sterilization. Even more revealing is the use of condoms by men. We see that condom use is less than 10% amongst currently married women. 
once again, it reveals how difficult it is for women to convince men to take responsibility uh, for family planning. It is also important to note that there are close to 16 million abortions a year in India. Abortions have become yet another way of addressing the problem of unwanted babies, a sad option. I am sure everybody will agree. It's a really sad option to adopting modern methods of contraception. The seriousness of the abortion issue agenda stands out where abortion stands out when the figure of 16 million abortions a year is juxtaposed against 23 to 24 million babies who are born every year. This is truly a tragedy. And I want to reiterate here, and I want to say that I am absolutely for abortion as an inalienable right under any circumstance. But should abortion be a proxy for contraception is something that should put all of us almost at shame and do something about it. Behind the number of abortions, we often, we often tend to forget the emotional trauma that women go through when they have to abort a fetus. Uh, this is unfortunate given that India was amongst one of the first countries in the world to launch a national population policy in the 1950s. We also had a fairly successful family planning program, and many of you would remember the Ham Do, Hamare Do campaigns and the jingles that went uh, with the social marketing campaign. Um, the, minist the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare continues to strengthen the family planning program and expand the basket of contraceptive choices in the public health system to meet people's sexual and reproductive health need. And NFHS 5 was a huge complement and affirmation of the efforts that the government has made. I would especially like to mention the MPV program, which focuses on the more high fertility districts, which is great targeting and focusing. In 1917, Government of India introduced new contraceptives namely an injectable contraceptive called Antara and the Centocromin pill Chaya into the public health system. The government also launched, as I said earlier, Mission Parivar Vikas in 146 high focus districts. And I'm very glad to see that the program and objectives to increase access to family planning choices within a rights-based framework is increasingly being adapted. And thanks to NFHS 5 results, especially in the MPV districts, we are very happy to hear that the government, uh, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare is expanding MPV to all the Northeast Indian states, as well as other high focus states. The government's efforts have yielded positive results. The total unmet need for family planning has declined from 12.9% to close to 9.4% or actually just 9.4% in 2019-21. Uh, quality of care in family planning has improved significantly. 62% of current users in 2021 reported having received information on slide, uh, side effects from service providers up to 46% in 2015-16. But despite the progress made by India on various population health and family planning indicators, the discourse around the implementation of coercive population policies has been gaining momentum in the recent times. Um, stringent uh, it is important to assert at this point that there is really no need to adopt China's one-child policy or even enforce a two-child norm. Stringent population measures a term appropriate for 
referring to China's measures have created a population crisis for China. China introduced the one-child policy in the late 1970s in an attempt to boost economic progress by slowing down the rapid population growth before reversing um, um, the decision in 2016 to allow families to have two children. In May 2021, the Chinese government further revised its policies and allowed couples to have up to three children, admitting that the consequences of such coercive measures were counterproductive, the strict birth limits have created a rapidly aging population um, and shrinking workforce that is straining the country's economy. Today, with this, one hopes that those who have been demanding India, in India, that we emulate China in enforcing a one-child or two-child norm will realize the misplaced suggestions they are making. Enforcing a one-child norm, even a two-child norm, is impractical, unnecessary, and undesirable. We should learn from China's experience on the one-child policy, which had disastrous consequences. I always say we should learn from China what not to do as far as population policy is concerned. To begin with, the number of children a couple wants to have should be a private decision. An intervention, any intervention by the state, should be seen as a violation of fundamental rights. In any case, no country in the world has adopted such a one-child policy to lower fertility rates. No other country, sorry. We can learn from within India itself, where Kerala, Tamil Nadu, and other states have lowered their fertility without any coercion uh, uh, coercive measures. China's one-child policy has discriminated against the girl-child. The skewed sex ratio at birth went to reinforce son preference and worsen the discrimination against girl-child. There were reports of high rates of abortion as well as abandoning the girl-child in adoption centers where they would often be treated very badly. Sociologists have also pointed out to the adverse effect of the little emperor syndrome that sets in uh, where there is only a son in the family. Pampered parents, pampered by parents as well as grandparents, there are a, a additional psycho uh, social problems that arrive because of the one, two, four phenomena where the son may be required to bear the responsibility of supporting parents, grandparents, and both sets of parents, or, uh, both, bo four of them in their old age. In any case, such measures could work in an authoritarian state of China, but not in a democracy like India, to, which will have serious political repercussions. The memories of forced sterilization from emergency are still vivid in people's minds. I am surprised the topic of two-child norm is raked up quite frequently. Enforcing a two-child norm contradicts government's own position. The Ministry of Health and Family Welfare in an affidavit in the Supreme Court in December 2020 on a petition seeking implementation of the two-child norm has clarified the government's commission, uh, position, and I quote, International, I quote the State Minister for Health, um, as well as international experience shows that any coercion to have a certain number of children is counterproductive and leads to demographic distortions. The family welfare program is voluntary in nature, which enables couples to decide the size of their family and adopt the family planning methods best suited to them, according to their choice without any compulsion, unquote. Therefore, instead of implementing coercive policies, we need to focus on addressing social determinants of health, changing social norms, which deeply impact women's health and fertility decisions and outcomes. Next slide, please. Experts on social and behavior change Communication have often 
made a clear case for entertainment education and transmedia storytelling as an effective way of influencing behavior change in social norms. Global evidence has demonstrated the efficacy of entertainment in changing mindsets, which inspired Population Foundation of India's um, flagship entertainment program, Mai Kuch Bhi Kar Sakti Hu, I, a woman can achieve anything in English. Directed and no, uh, by the noted theater and film director Feroz Abbas Khan, the version behind the vision behind Mekhuj Bikar Sakti was to create a new normal in society where women have equal rights, equal access, equal agency as men. And if Dr. Bende was alive today and knew of this program, I think she would have been very proud to see. Uh, um, see the transmedia program. Slide third, next slide, please. Launched in 2014, um, um, the core of the initiative was a radio and television drama series whose messages were reiterated um, using a transmedia approach. A total of 183 episodes over three seasons of Mai Kuch Bhi Kar Sakti Hu has been broadcast till date over Doordarshan and All India Radio. The series has been aired in 12 lang languages across 50 countries on DD National, DD Regional Council, and DD India, and 216 radio stations. Millions have viewed the series. It has received 2 million calls from viewers on its integrated voice response system from 400,000 unique numbers across 29 states. Next slide, please. Let me highlight some of the results of a third party independent evaluation conducted for each season. We observed a positive uh, shift in knowledge, attitudes, and perception amongst viewers. Um, in season one, for instance, acceptability of dis domestic violence fell from 66% in the baseline to over 44% to 44% in the end line survey. At the end of season two, 33% married women um, of married male viewers said they were likely to use modern contraceptives in the next six months. In season three, almost Equal number of men and women reported watching the serial with a name like Mai Kuch Bhi Kar Sakti We were nervous how many men will watch, but we were very happy with the result. Knowledge of injectables increased for women viewers by 30 percentage points. Many, many more such initiatives are needed to bring about change in mindsets. Target social and behavior change, targeted social and behavior change communication strategies are needed to address social norms that constrain women's agency and reproductive harmony, autonomy. We must empower our women to decide if and when and how many children they should have. There is an unfinished agenda for the government to reach the last mile the most marginalized, the poor, the young population, especially adolescents, in order to address the unmet need for reproductive and family planning services. Finally, the, differentials, the differential impact of COVID-19 has affected women and girls across all spheres, including education, health, nutrition, safety, economic security, and access to technology. They're threatening to reverse decades of progress made towards achieving gender equality. Gender must be central to COVID-19 recovery measures as well as future pandemic preparedness. There, this is where we need new partnerships between government, private sector, ex uh, uh, experts, researchers, sociologists, and other professionals, as well as community-based organization and frontline workers, frontline health workers, NGOs, and others. Before I conclude, I want to point out 
that it is extremely important for us to be aware of the politics of language in this space. It is unfortunate to hear media anchors and others use the term population control. The term population control treats women as objects whose fertility can be controlled by policy actions. It brings back memories of emergency when state power was used against helpless citizens to forcibly sterilize women as well as men. To end then, even though the news on the number front is greatly encouraging, there is much that needs to be done to address the reproductive rights of the unreached. This calls for investing in um, expanding freedoms for girls and women, more specifically requires increased investments in women's education, women's health, adolescence and reproductive health, in creating job opportunities for women and in social and behavior change communication to change social norms, treat women with respect and dignity, and increase the participation of men in family planning. As we all know, human development is defined as an enhancement of capabilities, an expansion of freedoms, a widening of choices, and an assured human rights. In this sense, human development is the best contraceptive. If we take care of people, populations will take care of itself. I would like to end my lecture with a quote from J.R.D. Tata, eminent industrialist and founder of Population Foundation of India. I quote, I have always believed that no real social change can occur in any society unless women are educated, self-reliant and respected. Women is the critical fulcrum of family and community prosperity and clearly Dr. Bende was personified that. Thank you once again for this opportunity to share my thoughts with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Poonamat. That has been a wonderful exposure of what is really happening in the front, population front, and then how do we really take it forward in the future? I think you have given a clear-cut idea on what are the strategies one could perhaps follow to address many of the pressing issues which are confronting, especially in the women's front in this country, and also what are the way forward and how do we implement such kind of a program with even going with the clear-cut examples of your own institution which is on the transmedia program which has been sort of a very successful program which has been read out i think it has really been wonderful to listening from you and i think most importantly i think the last message is very very critical I think which has started with the development as the best contraceptive as early as in 1974 by the then health minister of this country. But you are telling that human development is very, very critical and that you have established by showing the religious wise fertility, the caste wise fertility, and also clearly showed that ultimately what matters is the investment in human capital or human development. So that is perhaps the most important strategy one can adopt really to achieve most of the goals. Thank you so much for this excellent lecture. And I'm sure there will be many questions. All those who would like to ask questions, I think some of who have been given access to unmute and ask questions for others, please feel free to put your questions in the chat box. We will look at it and try to answer as much as possible. But I think many of you also have been given access of Unmuting yourself and this question, please feel free to ask questions. You can either sh show some indication or please you can also unmute and ask directly questions. I think by that time they unmute, perhaps I will ask one or two. Please. Uh, yeah question because it has been 
really excellent. Uh, one of the issues uh, I was really thinking about, you know, the, the how do we really take it forward, especially in this case of fertility transition when we really look at because the major concerns, you know, you have given examples of Bihar, uh, that is really a classic examples. But at the same time, always the concern is that are we in a position to wait till a human development happens in achieving the family planning or in achieving the fertility goals? That is what has been always a concern, especially those states which has a high fertility has always this concern. Is it possible for us to wait till then? So if not, what are the immediate strategies that can be adopted? Some of the examples you have given are also immediate in uh, nature. But maybe I think I don't know whether you may have some light to throw on upon what could be perhaps as because some of the states has even a larger concern also for many states now the concern has completely has gone away. But then you know the media circle as well as perhaps the pressures from what all harm the society has a perception that you know some of the northern states has high fertility you need to control it otherwise it will affect the population growth so how do we really address it quickly that is has been always the issue so whether you have anything to yes yeah. yes so i i am a strong believer that we should not wait while i believe in human development education those are good goals in themselves and they also uh, facilitate fertility transition but i believe not a single woman should get pregnant not a single woman should get pregnant if she does not wish to have a child and no child should be an unwanted child so having said that there are many things i'd like to suggest the first is you know we uh, in population foundation of india we did a analysis of the expenditures you know that disaggregated data is not available for budgets within health and family planning for family planning and within family planning what are the expenditures so we discovered four percent only uh, um, which is now increased to six when we did the analysis in 2017 only four percent of the expenditures on family planning uh, of our low health budget is on family planning and within that you'll be shocked to know that 85% of the expenditures are on sterilization. Of the 15% of the expenditures, 13.5% of the expenditures are on um, equipment and training and only 1.5% on temporary methods. Now, in a country where 70% of the population momentum is fueled by a young population at a reproductive age who needs spacing methods, we took 30 years to introduce these two spacing methods, centrochrome and the crimen and um, injectables. That also, we haven't ordered, uh, ordered, we have a very small amount number of injectables we introduced. We didn't work on shaping demand. So we need more temporary methods. We need to invest more money. We need to invest uh, in introducing more temporary methods and shape the demand. If you look at countries around us, implants have been introduced long ago injectables too we just introduce injectables icmr study approves uh, uh, and has given every reason for india to introduce implants but for five years we've done nothing we really need to make a push to have more temporary methods manage side effects give fixed day services and we need to uh, 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 we need to analyze whether when people want lower fertility, whether they need to invest huge amount of money in incentives on sterilization. People go for sterilization when they have had fixed number of children. You know, one shocking data I'm sure all of you know is that Indian women who experience sterilization do so uh 77 percent have never experienced a temporary method so i would say flood the primary health care center with uh, uh temporary methods where there's a shortage you know the demand outstrips the supply now these are no they don't require much work behavior change education all of this requires investment creativity and uh, so on. The simplest thing to do is 
counsel women and men and counsel them when not only when they're giving birth to children, when they go for your pre and postnatal tests. I cannot understand why this gap of unmet need is not met. You know, we have to have a commitment to family planning. Unfortunately, I'm even worried NFHS 5 will make us more complacent. The results from NFHS 5 will make us more complacent. So education, all of that, we must continue because that those are long term impact it's going to have and give us a foundation. But in the short term, improving quality choice and giving information on fertility early on, which is uh, in the form of sexual and reproductive health to girls and boys early on to postpone the first child, postpone marriage, postpone getting, uh, having too many babies too quickly. All this will have huge results. Improve, uh, 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 postponing age at marriage is a sure contraceptive pill. Thank you. I think that is the important, very important message. I think suggestions, especially choices, giving them more choices as well as giving them information. These are the two ways we can really address this issue. I think there is another question in the chat box, which is saying, what do you think uh, about the increasing age at marriage for women in India? I think this is a question which always everyone confronts now, all of us confronts now. <laughs> yes. Yesterday I was taking a, giving a lecture at the National Defense College. The major question was on what about this bill, which is already introduced in the parliament. <laughs> So I would love it, to know your views, Professor James. No, and no, I, hope no, you'll share your, I will ask you that question after I give the answer. Um, um, and I hope you'll share your views too. I, um, I think increasing age at marriage is a secular trend, which we must do, but not, I oppose and I'm an uncomfortable with increasing the legal age at marriage to 21. And I'll explain why. And I'll also explain a solution and share my solution. My solution to government saying we want gender equity, equality between men and girls is to decrease the age of male uh, at mar uh, from 21 to 18. So both will be 18 and there'll be gender equality. Now, reason why legal enactment will not help because it has not helped in the past. Have you heard of anyone getting jailed because of uh, uh, marrying early, either the priest or the people who attended the wedding or the parents? Only time parents raise the issue is when there is the, if they don't like the boy that the girl has married, or if it is a caste issue or a religion issue. Girls, we've had this law that girls can get married only at age 18 for se for years now, almost six to seven decades. But girls, even now, we have one in four girls getting married below the age 18 and earlier it was much more. What is stopping girls from getting married early is education. Uh, if they are in school, if there is prospects of girls getting uh, jobs, um, I, what will happen is there'll be many more girls getting married uh, below the age uh, 21 and more marriages will go underground just like they are now. They, the, the wrong age of the child is given. Number three, I am against this is because it violates the right of a 21 year old who can vote at an earlier age, but they can't get married. If somebody wishes to get married at age 20, for whatever reason, we cannot violate their right to get married. Finally, there is, uh, there is, there are other ways for government to work. For instance, uh, 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 make not just primary education, but higher education compulsory, bring schools, closer to girls, understand why people don't put their girls in, um, uh, allow their girls to uh, study because they feel insecure and unsafe. Then the dowry issue, as girls get older, 
parents have to pay more dowry so they take the children out of school get them married understand those underlying social factors and work on those parents will not stop getting their girls married because you make it legal we know that and then we'll have complacency the government will feel and all of us will feel oh we've changed the legal age now we don't need to do anything so unless you get your diagnosis right you will not get your treatment right and i feel that this particular case the motivation is um, the motivation, if it is equality, which is what has been said, then make both the ages 18. And there are, I can name many other reasons, but I want to know your response to this. Oh, no. <laughs> I was, no, almost similar. I'm saying there is no suspicion to the fact that, you know, age at marriage, just, it is important to increase the age at marriage of women. It is quite low in, in the country. There is, but what is the route to achieve that goal is something which we really need to debate. Eh? Whether it's a legal framework can really help in that direction or whether we need information, whether we need to really work with the parents and the young girls, that is, that's what we really need mm. to show because a legal framework often may not help the women. Finally, if you Absolutely. want to penalize them, that may really look a little pain affecting them rather than really helping them because at the end of the day you are telling that your marriage is illegal you may have to separate now after getting married so that is really not going to help them at all at the end of the day so no no and also so, if you look at the world countries where the age at marriage is really high they don't have any legal uh, enactment so uh, if you look at the rest of the world there are hardly any countries in Japan. Japan, I was surprised. The age of marriage is 20. But India, I just don't understand knowing that we can't do legal implementation, enactment, and we have to change the mindset. Uh, behavior change communication. You know, there is a, um, a child protection officer on our advisory council from uh, Haryana. And she said, she listened to all of us on age at marriage and she said, you know something, you, the problem with the issue of age at marriage is very complex. You all think it's a problem while the community thinks it's a solution. So she says, every time I go to the police and I take them, try to uh, take them to a place where there is a uh, underage marriage taking place, the police walas keep telling her, Madam, unka ghar basne do. why are you destroying their home? So they see it as a solution. Even the police in the community see it as a solution. So it's a very complex problem which cannot be fixed by one legal enactment. That's true. Thank you. I think there are a large number of questions in the chat box. I will take it up. But let me see if any participants would like to ask any questions who has been given right to unmute. Please unmute and feel free to ask questions. Yeah, please go ahead, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, one thing which is very striking uh, that uh, why male sterilization is going down? What is the reason? Whether our program is not catering to the male or uh, we are totally ignoring male sterilization. The second one is uh, in the states where fertility has already declined, should we not start talking about inclusion of uh, fertility treatment in our family planning programs? These are my two, <laughs> you can say, suggestions or uh, thought about why male sterilization is going down and when we will start fertility treatment in our family planning program. How okay. we can start also. Okay, so this is my favorite subject, uh, Saida ji, um, um, uh, which is men. Saida ji, that is more than... <laughs> uh, Why men don't participate in family planning? Uh, so, and as far as sterilization, well, men think it's a women's issue, women's burden. You see, we have to put even practicing patriarchy is women's business. Everything burden is women. Why don't men get sterilized? So um, men are very, um, men are quite obsessed with their uh, virility. There is this myth that uh, men have that, uh, and society has, even women have that, if they get sterilized, their virility will decrease. 
in fact even the women will say nahi nahi wo weak ho jayenge even the women don't want because this myth we have to break this myth but there is this myth second you know i also believe that uh, uh, in the village and in our societies everybody comes to know uh, if somebody gets sterilized whether it's male sterilization or female sterilization and there is no study on this so uh, allow me to um, give my impression and this is on the basis of my conversations with people in the community men and women and i always tease the men when i'm sitting in communities talking to them that you know if a woman god forbid a woman gets pregnant we know there is extramarital sex in the society if a married woman gets pregnant and the man has got sterilized can you imagine the state of the man i do believe this plays into the hand and that's nothing we can do about it but we can definitely work on blowing the myth that sterilization uh, reduces uh, pleasure or um, virility third we have not paid any attention to male sterilization after the emergency you know it was fine to continue because we are a patriarchal society it was fine to continue um doing sterilization as far as women are concerned but the men revolted reacted and sterilization greatly increased decreased sorry after the emergency the government did away with the multi purpose health worker you can't expect asha to be going to a man to do family planning uh or to talk about family planning so with the go, uh, with the go, going away of the doing away of the multi purpose health worker and the health system only dealing with women we must engage men we must insist men come for check up so that they can be counseled uh when women go for pre post um immunization um as uh, 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 and we need to address men i think even our public health system and has let the men off the hook we today even when you look for sterilize if people want sterilization we don't have trained doctors surgeons in uh, uh, in doing uh, um, vasectomies so we have to put that on the agenda in a big way we have to engage i don't believe that if it is our men are badly socialized from the very beginning and make women responsible for too many things i think the state as well as society it's not a women's issue family planning it's as much as men's issue it's a societal issue society has to take a response which is both government ngos academics and researchers we have to look at this and draw greater attention and behavior change will change you know like we said when we started this mai kuch bhi kar sakti hu and it was so much about family planning we were very unsure men will see it and to see 48% men seeing mai kuch bhi kar sakti hu and continuing to see it was is is a statement in itself that men are not disinterested you know i believe that there is nothing wrong with our men it just that we socialize them badly and we bring them up badly and we don't give them the responsibility and engage them and we we have to make a very serious and sincere effort at doing so and i hope that nfhs 6 or 7 at least will try to understand that better how we can engage men and what is the male response but i want to give you just one more small incident that in mai kuch bhi kar sakti hu when we we read newspaper uh, reports from bundelkhand that a group of men started a uh, in in chatarpur men of chatarpur started a movement where they said we were inspired by mai kuch bhi kar sakti hu uh they will never they will not beat their wives anymore and they will get sterilized and they will help women in child rearing and we didn't we, we sent a team to uh, from our office to see if it was true this movement has started and bundelkhand is such a backward patriarchal area we, it was true and so we made a film called real to real on these men of chatarpur which we'll be happy to share with you which is an inspiration 
and second states where for, uh, absolutely i think every as a right every family or woman if she doesn't want children she should have access to contraception if she wants children and cannot have children she should have access to for support in fertility um uh um uh, which is very expensive at this point of time poor cannot afford it and i think the public health system should think about um um uh, giving um giving this but you know uh, we are very far from it because we don't have money for family planning um but we should start making the case uh saida ji for um uh, for this thank you thank you very much thank you any other questions please feel Wait, unmute. By the way, says it, there is a, uh, you know, the Foxy is making a big case for it. And maybe you can join them and lend them your voice. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I will do that. Yeah, it's a deep thing. Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry I joined just a little late. But what, uh, uh, ma'am, you told about, uh, like, say, uh, this new law of increasing the age up to 21. Uh, it is a good uh, movement, but I feel that seeing that maybe last 20, 30 year our trend, maybe an FHS or even census shows that uh, age at marriage is increasing. And maybe because of education and also at that point, I want to tell you that uh, uh, whatever little, I'm not, uh, uh, I don't work on, on this uh, family planning and all this one, but uh, as far as I understand, like, uh, and FHS also asked that how much, you know, who accompanied you and like that. So over the year also, like men is also now educated male and even maybe less uh, educated also. They also accompany and uh, uh, this one. So it slowly takes time, like any social behavior which have been deep rooted in our uh, society based on that kind of, you know, uh, people remark and all these things. But slowly changes are happening. Maybe what you say is that like all this uh, NGO, politician, this politician, they don't make point, no, to how to change the society. Now there is a lot of halla gulla about caste system and caste because of election. Again, they will forget it. Yeah. So I wanted to tell you, I ask you that age at marriage also one should keep in mind relation with the fertility curve. No, one cannot change the fertility curve, the natural thing one. So somewhere, how to postpone that is a kind of you know, support government should give and um, make that uh, village level kind of effort that how to stop that early marriages. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I totally agree with you, uh, Dr. Singh, that age at marriage is incre increasing. It's a secular trend, but it has much to do with girls' education. When girls are in school, there is a trend to marry the girls later. Also, if there are opportunities for girls to um, uh, work, it inspires the parents. So age at marriage is increasing. But as you said, it is a very slow process. We can hasten the process not only for fertility decline, but also because it empowers girls. It uh, uh, prevents um, uh, early marriage, maternal mortality, therefore child mortality, which is associated with early marriage, having early pregnancies and too many. But we have to invest a whole range, you know, whether it's uh, uh, invest in anemia, we have to invest in girls' security and having schools close to the girl, uh, this thing. And another reason we must, we must not wait for an incremental growth is because you know girls aspirations have changed we have to meet the aspirations of the girls girls in india in fact are changing very fast if you look at any indicator and part of the reason is the access is not only education but the access girls and families and men all of them have to media you see, media has shown the other half how the better half lives. The other half knows that, you know, today parents want fewer children. They want to educate their children. Girls want to be educated and be independent. 
In fact, there is a recent study that shows that girls are very unhappy and anxious about the political environment in India because they don't want to be told what to wear, what to eat. They don't want parents. We all as parents are having a tough time dealing with our children at home who don't want us to tell them anything. But this is not just the middle class and rich children. This is also the poor children and the most backward areas. The girls have become aspirations. And if India doesn't meet their aspirations, we are going to do a huge mistake. You know, in India, the second largest in the world, the second largest suicides come from Indian uh, adolescents and of which girls are overtaking the boys as are girls doing well in education, in getting educational achievements, as well as getting admission and places like medical, IIT, or law colleges everywhere. So we have to meet the aspirations of the girls and it cannot be incremental growth. I'm afraid because the world has changed so radically, people's exposure is so radical to what is right, what is wrong, or what is and their aspirations have changed. We need to do something strongly and patriarchal norms. Unfortunately, you see, we have to deal with the fact that women's issues are we go two step forward and one and a half step backward and when we are maintaining the half gain we've made. So what is happening is like behavior change I'm talking about. You know, if you look at all the serials, except Mai Kujbikar Sakti or and a couple of other serials, they're so regressive. They make women look like, um, 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 if you look at this uh, uh, serials, they, I feel they make women look like nagins and working women are looked down upon. So in fact, recently Colors TV has bought Mai Kuchbikar Satyu rights for two years and I feel, and they have such regressive um, um, <laughs> shows on them. I feel they bought our program to improve their image. And so what we really need to do is we need to only different, and I, no, you and I don't have a difference. We both feel we have to change social norms and increase aided marriage. But the only thing is, let's not accept it should be incremental. We have enough data globally on what works in terms of entertainment education to change social norms. We know what it takes to put girls in school and retain them in school. Let's work on that. Okay, thank you. I think there are oh. large, yeah, this. Yeah. Oh, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, this topic is very interesting and important to discuss. Uh, I got uh, more elaborated on this topic. Uh, I just I'd like to have a only one question, madam. That you know, uh, as per the uh, inequality world report, uh, the India is uh, one among the top countries. And uh, I, as you know, that you know the uh, inequality has uh, a, a significant impact on uh, you know, fertility behavior of the people also. And uh, you know uh, that uh, you know even now also nowadays, if there are poor families. Who believe that? Who believe that, uh, that they want to have more than one child because of their child survival value, and uh, sometimes the companionship value also. So just I would like to know. The, still, we have uh, some uh, uh, important uh, policies uh, to reduce the inequality of uh, economic conditions, and still some hindrances are there. So I would like to, I request you to kindly throw some light on what are the interests, how to reduce such kind of uh, economic inequalities so that uh, we can have a balanced development and uh, through persuasive approach, we can have uh, still, uh, you know, quality oriented population or the reduced size of the family. Thank you so much. Thank you. So economic inequalities and you are so right lead to uh, have an impact on fertility and especially when families are insecure whether the child will survive or not and I mentioned that too in my lecture and that was one reason you know uh, when child survival rates were very poor fertility rates were much high so there is a correlation but in terms of economic inequalities you know even where I first want to refer to health 
which is something that we are all concerned about. And since I, uh, 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 there is so much data that comes out of uh, IIPS on health related issues, we do know that in spite of improvements in health, when there are sadly increase, there's a huge increase in NCDs, which are diseases very expensive to treat, whether it's heart, cancer, and we know that catastrophic illnesses destroy and undo the reverse the gains that have been made in narrowing the inequalities and uh, 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 where we had made huge progress in bringing down poverty rates, catastrophic illnesses and illnesses contribute to huge debts um, that families undergo and go back uh, uh, as given the entitlement failures, they go back into poverty. I think we need to invest in health in a big way. We need to not just invest in terms of money, but we need to invest in better management, promotion, health promotive and preventive measures, self-care, um, health education, health literacy, uh, apart from behavior change communication. So that is one. Second, if we invest in not just education, but skilling, you know, in India, we have this demographic dividend opportunity, which the window will be closing. Only 4% of Indians have the skills that the market has to offer for jobs. We have to skill our people. We have to invest in not just education, but along with education, skilling opportunities. We have to have um, entitlements which people know about. You know, even the different schemes you refer to that government has, we roll out the schemes, but are they effective? We are, I often say, we are a scheming society. We roll out the scheme, whether it works or not, we neither measure it. We have the institutions to measure the impact. And I want to give you an example here. There is this scheme, uh, 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 there is a scheme across India in 18 states, including uh, in Haryana called Apni Beti Apna Dhan, where girls are given uh, when they turn 18, 25,000 rupees, which was invested when they are born is given, it becomes 1 lakh rupees and parents are given. You know, we never conveyed to the parents that this was not money for dowry. This was money that the girls get educated and get married after 18. Parents only waited the, to give the money for dowry to their children. So, you know, we have to have schemes that work, that we have to, we evaluated this scheme along with ICRW. So we have to have schemes there where we have to invest in the community where it is working and behavior, uh, no, in, in terms of creating employment opportunities. Look at the country where we have a shortage of nurses, doctors, ANMs across India, as well as teachers. Why aren't we planning? We need to do better planning. We need to train people in the areas where jobs market does exist. Training, for instance, we India has to get ready as our young population, the demographic dividend goes, we have uh, adverse sex, no, we have ratios of old people with young people, which are going to be adverse and change. We need to get ready for giving health care to the elderly. I, in a country where there isn't social security, we are not going to be able to give them health care in the hospitals, but at least we can give some health care. We can have trained health uh, uh, assistants. They look at the number of people who will get jobs. So we have to be a little more creative in reimagining how we create jobs for people uh, in India. And finally, we have to see what our rations and entitlements look like. Is giving wheat, rice, and sugar good for people's uh, is it going to enhance their health should we be giving pulses should we be giving coarse coarse grains 
we have to re we, we we have to reimagine rethink and assess how we can improve poverty and our policies and programs need to be reviewed we never evaluate we rarely evaluate our programs and even when we do like the icds program it is too political to change we have to bite a bullet we have a government in power which has huge majority it is time where we recognize as dr uh, james said in the very beginning that we have to look at the gaps and address them and that is something i keep trying to do in articulating but as a society we do have to see how what we can do and i do believe there is no problem that doesn't have a solution thank you i think we have to maybe perhaps stop now because it's quite late and the uh, but still there are large number of participants and large number of questions also in the chat box so i think i perhaps stop in further questions but maybe i will just condense the questions which is in the chat box you can perhaps answer that i think one set of questions i think maybe it's five or six such questions are there what could be sort of a solution for reaching the underserved i think one is media definitely what is the role of media and the whether it is the sex education the school sees the solution or whether it is more investment in education is a solution or maybe digital revolution which is happening that is a social solution so sort of a something on that what is perhaps sort of a way out to really to reach the people who are not served or maybe large number of people who has to be served that is one sort of a question i think that's that should be can, can perhaps there are other sort of questions which are more in sort of a demographic why population policies are not succeeding etc maybe we can take up later maybe this would be a, a last question we can say if perhaps yeah. you, your views will be important okay. so reaching the unreached is the best and most important question for this country to address you know we always roll out programs and schemes and then we say we didn't reach the last mile we have to the lesson from that for me is we have to start with the last mile it is the toughest we take the easy route out where we reach the better off amongst the poor you know whether it's microfinance or any government scheme it always reaches the better off and then we feel very good you know we've achieved x number uh, we've achieved the numbers we never uh, so we have to reverse so any policy and program should actually start with the most underserved and the last mile and once we design the program thinking of the last mile we will be able to effectively work with them and let me give a couple of uh, uh, just one or two uh, strategies of reaching the mass last mile you know a pfi was doing a rolling out the urban health mission when the urban health mission was designed we had a tripartite agreement with the government of india usaid that funded us to design the urban health and we did something called vulnerability assessment mapping in fact we i insisted that the first training we wanted to do of government officials and state nodal officers was in vulnerability mapping and the bureaucrats kept saying to me yes yes it's important but why do you want to begin with it so i said you know even if i don't do anything else we want to put vulnerability and how to map it on the agenda and of course it's gathering dust i have to tell you i didn't succeed i did do some training and we do hear people talk about vulnerability but we didn't work on reaching the last mile but it's not an agenda i or anyone should give up we should use vulnerability mapping to design our programs to reach them last mile first second we need to have for instance ashas and anms we need and all health workers we need or teachers we need a certain percentage from scheduled caste scheduled tribes and different religious communities we need to identify finally we need to identify 
because the higher caste one will not go to the Dalit villages. So we need a combination of um, uh, people, uh, for, uh, uh, representation. Third, I think it's really important that we find creative ways. And the, as I said, there is no problem that doesn't have a solution. Like tribal areas in Andhra Pradesh, an NGO uh, which was set up by um, uh, Satyam and then was taken over by the IMR, you know, the um, uh, um, ambulance service, the same people, 108. Uh, the same people also did this innovation, which when I was in MacArthur, I funded. It was called Doc on a Donkey. Doctors were very angry with me that we gave that, that I was funding a project called Doc on a Donkey. But they would put, a, they made a suitcase full of, um, you know, an, a, the suitcase, a hard suitcase had all the testing equipment include, uh, and they sent it on a donkey along with the health worker to the tribal areas where vans, emergency, uh, uh, this um, ambulances could not go or uh, 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 mobile vans, health vans could not go. So we have to find if there are the roads aren't narrow, we need a donkey, we need a horse, maybe more respectable than a donkey. We, we must work on creative solutions in reaching the last mile. Finally, I think mobile, mobile health services is a solution. And yes, digital technology and um, uh, is, is a solution, but it has to be done creatively where people in the villages and the most backward areas do not have access to computer technology. So your healthcare facility, your um, um, uh, 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 primary healthcare center and others should have the... Uh, possibility of digital outreach um, from there. And digital outreach can help a lot, but there are some health issues you can't deal with. And finally, large number of, um, and there is no moving away an excuse from not investing more in our public health system. And I want to give one example doctors, you know, if our doctors are not well paid, if our, we don't take care of their children to send them to uh, good uh, 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 schools where their boarding facilities and pay for them, why will doctors go, whether it's private sector or public sector? You don't find many doctors in tribal areas. And this whole shortage of health staff we have to deal with for the most backward areas, we must give them good incentives to go uh, where, you know, the un unreached uh, places. And finally, large number of, I, I there was a last question, Professor James, last point you made, and I didn't take it down. It just says large number of children, no? Large number of? Oh, why do our because family planning policies don't work? Don't work, then is it? So that family planning policies didn't work and population is still increasing, then what's the solution? That kind of a very general question. Yeah, you know, it's it requires a lot of time to answer that question, but I'll try and be brief. Our family planning policies partly did not work because um, we did three things we did. We didn't do, sorry. One, the demand is much more than the supply. There is a supply failure. You will find shortage of condoms. You will find shortage of uh, uh, pills. And you will find that uh, uh, our uh, highest demand in India, and we promote sterilization, which was only in camps. You could not get it on demand only recently. Fixed day services have started, camps continue. Do women, dis you know, and so women get pregnant in one encounter of sex, but we have to wait for a camp to take place to get our contraceptive services. Contraceptive services have to be available closest to the community on demand. Number two, as I said earlier, we have a large young population and we, people need to postpone their first child or space the child. And if you don't have invest in temporary methods, when all the countries around us 
had seven, eight methods, including countries like Pakistan, Bangladesh, and so on. India had only five methods. In It took us 30 years to introduce one new contraceptive. When we know that if you introduce one contraceptive at any point of time, an additional contraceptive leads to between 6 and 12% of uh, increase in usage. You know, emergency set us back a lot. In emergency, when we had forced sterilization and there was this perception, which I believe is wrong, that Mrs. Gandhi and Congress party lost elections only because of sterilization. I don't believe it is true, but perceptions is what matter then and today. So people's political leaders stop talking about family planning, stop promoting family planning, stopped investing in family planning. And finally, I think the 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 the, the, the six percent of our meager one point two percent of our budget in family planning has done us in. You know, what India had is rich demographic data, not only the last uh, three decades from NFHS, but from census, from NSSO and other data sources. India is a demographically rich data country, but all our politicians and did was to say population is a problem and they used it as an excuse for inaction. We said every time a health minister was asked, why don't we have enough hospitals or why don't we have enough? This? Oh, population is high. Education minister, transport minister, everybody uses education as a, sees it as a problem and has the solution, diagnosis wrong, solution wrong. They think people want more children, therefore we have children. People want to reduce their fertility. They don't have access to family planning. Finally, I want to say it is the price we've had to pay for patriarchy and gender inequality, not giving women the agency and the opportunities to exercise their fertility and use of contraceptives. The mother-in-law, along with the partner or husband, son, has done us in in this country. The sooner we let women have more freedom to decide and access to family planning, our population policies, we won't have to worry about because people's aspirations are to have less than two children. But I want to say at the end, my experience with the bureaucracy in India, whether it is Ministry of Health and Family Welfare or at the state level, our bureaucracy in the health gets what the family problem planning issues are, problems are, and it is very impressive that they have used the data that you produce in IIPS. They consume it and digest it and analyze it very well. We need more political commitment in terms of investing money, and we need to move a little faster on better governance and reaching family planning services to those who have the least. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was really wonderful to listen to your views on many of these important issues that confront the nation. I think all of us really ask these questions on a daily basis. Why population policies has not succeeded? Why? What are the ways to reach the millions of people who are unserved, etc.? I think, you know, the solutions which you are given, it appears that there are solutions. We need to have innovative thinking, a technological solutions which we need to use very productively and so on and so forth. So I was really happy to listen to many of these issues and many of the solutions and also more importantly your views on many of these pressing issues. Thank, Thank you. you so but I, my that. learning is from NFHS and the other data. IIPS is my guru. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the acknowledgement. Thanks. And let me call upon now Dr. Deepthi Govil to post a formal lot of thanks. How about you, Deepthi? Thank you, sir. Uh, respected Dr. Uh, Poonam Mukherjee, Professor K.S. James, Professor T.V. Shekhar, faculty colleagues, distinguished guests, and my dear participants. Uh, it's my pleasure to propose a vote of thanks on the occasion of 11th Asha Bhinde Memorial Lecture. I, on behalf of Publication Cell and Short Term Training Program of IAPS, extend a very hearty vote of thanks to all those who contributed to the success of this lecture series. At the onset, I would like to express my gratitude to Dr. Poonam Mukherjee for 
wholeheartedly accepting our invitation and sparing her valuable time to deliver the 11th uh, Professor Asha A. Binde Memorial Lecture. We are privileged to have you uh, with us, ma'am, today. Your crisp and thought provoking lecture on the road of roadmap to population stabilization, a case for reaching the unreached, has raised several undebatable issues. Uh, and I believe that the guidelines and the strategies uh, provided by you will be helpful or useful for motivating young uh, minds to work and contemplate on the issues in the area of population stabilization from the perspective of unserved and unleash. Once again, thank you so much, ma'am, for taking us to the bottom of the problem. Uh, it's my profound duty to thank all the distinguished participants for their active participation and dynamic discussion to make the lecture a grand success. We look forward for such enthusiastic participation in upcoming lectures. Thank you so much. I am very Thank grateful you. to Professor K.S. James, uh, Director IAPS, to invest trust in us and provided us with the responsibility to execute the lecture series. Uh, he has been very supportive throughout the period uh, of preparation and provided his valuable inputs and comments as and when required. Uh, in this series, I would like to express my hearty gratitude to the staff of Publication Cell and Short Term Training Program, Dr. Vadalingam, Dr. Babu Shantosh Kumar, and Ms. Irene Solomon, to extend their unconditional and timely logistic support in organizing the lecture. Thank you, team, for providing all the necessary support and enabling environment to make this lecture possible. And I extend my thanks to ICT unit, uh, especially Mr. Anjani and uh, Mr. Avinash and the team for providing technical support during organizing this lecture. Uh, with their support, we could have a smooth and uninterrupted virtual session. And I cannot miss to mention the unconditional support from administration and accounts department for their cooperation during the process. Uh, I cannot thank everyone enough for their involvement and their willingness to take uh, take on the completion of the task beyond their comfort zone. So thank you so much, everyone, and I wish you all a very happy weekend. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, and all thank you. It was a pleasure. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This program is closed.